finally this week, as the uh, post-mortem from the election continues for Democrats and liberals, uh, they continue to look for any possible explanation they can for their loss, to blame anybody or anything at all they can for their loss, except, of course, for looking into the mirror and blaming themselves. We could never expect them to do that, now could we? The latest, the latest thing they are blaming is fake news sites that are shared among the internet, among Facebook and Twitter and so on and so forth. And over the last couple of weeks, we've heard liberal commentator after liberal commentator decry all of these fake news sites that are spreading falsehoods. And by golly, so many of these things get shared that that has to be why Donald Trump won the election. Well, it's not. We told you a couple of weeks ago why Donald Trump won the election. It's more of an issue of one one set of cultural values versus another, one set of right and wrong values versus another. We won't rehash all of that, but that's really what it was. But in any event, they want to blame these uh, fake news sites as, I guess, a, a easy explanation for why their supposedly brilliant ideas did not carry the day in America. And indeed, our own erstwhile, soon-to-be ex-president, Barack Obama, chimed in, saying, and I quote, Generally, we've got elections that aren't focused on issues and are full of fake news and false information and distractions. Then the issue is not going to be what's happening from the outside. The issue is going to be what we are doing for ourselves from the inside. Aww. Did Obama not wipe the, the result of the election? Aww, that's too bad. And, of course, he's not blaming himself. He's not blaming his administration. He's not blaming the uh, results of what he's done. He's blaming fake news sites. And uh, Facebook and Google were quick to jump on this bandwagon. Facebook uh, has updated their language and their Facebook audience network policy, which uh, says it will not display ads and sites that show misleading content to include fake news sites. Google is banning websites that peddle fake news from using its online advertising service. So they're trying to do everything they can to keep this fake news out of the hands of you and I. Now, granted... We get into a very dangerous area when we start discussing what is fake news and what is real news and why on earth social media companies and government officials and liberal commentators should be the ones to decide what is fake news and what isn't. That seems to open up a pretty awful can of worms when one thinks about it. But as it stands, this is really just yet another liberal attempt to control the media and to keep opposing viewpoints out. And what if I told you it wasn't the first time? What if I told you this was nothing new? What if I told you this has been a key play page in the liberal playbook for over a half century? I want to take you back in history a little bit. Think of talk radio. When you think of talk radio, what do you think of? You think of a lot of conservative talk shows out there right now? You probably think of Rush Limbaugh, kind of the, the guy that has been uh, viewed as the godfather of modern conservative talk radio, and no doubt he's been extremely successful, extremely influential. If it weren't for Rush Limbaugh, people like me would never have had the opportunity to do what we do, and we all owe him a great uh, great degree of thanks and, and gratitude. But um, a lot of people look at Rush Limbaugh as kind of the forerunner for this uh, golden age of conservative talk radio that, that we experience now. But what if I told you that Rush Limbaugh in the early 1990s was not the first age the first golden age of conservative talk radio. What if I told you that the first cons first golden age of conservative media actually preceded Limbaugh's fame by about 30 years? Oh yes, it did. If you go back to the late 1950s and early 1960s, with television being a burgeoning, burgeoning new technology in America, and with radio still being a very important medium in this country. There were broadcasters and, and uh, companies such as those run by H.L. Hunt and Dan Smoot that produced fantastic conservative programming, fantastic anti-communist programming during that period of time. And they were on not only radio stations all across the country, big and small, but they were also on major network television. In the formative years of ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, they put a lot of Dan Smoot shows on and H.L. Hunt shows on. Man, could you imagine ABC delivering, you know, putting out uh, conservative-focused uh, 
programming in prime time? No, you couldn't, but in the late 1950s, they did. And on the radio, that followed suit as well. H.L. Hunt was uh, at one time the richest man in America. He was, by the way, a, a very rich oil man down in Dallas and uh, was the father of Lamar Hunt, who founded the, the American Football League of the Kansas City Chiefs. Great man. And Hunt devoted a lot of his fortune and his resources to providing conservative-focused uh, programming on the radio and television. Dan Smoot followed suit. And they weren't the only ones. There were also uh, some reverends out there who, who mixed good uh, conservative politics in with their religious programming and anti-communist views in with their religious programming. People like Reverend Carl McIntyre and Reverend Billy James Hargis. And at the time, of course, all of these programs, all of these shows were derided by those who were supposedly in the know in New York and Washington. They were poo-pooed. They were decried. And yet, they found a terrific audience. In fact, uh, a lot of the groundswell that ended up resulting in Barry Goldwater's Republican candidacy in 1964 could be traced in part to programs like this. Well, the Democrats thought something just had to be done about this. We couldn't allow this kind of programming to be on the air now, could we? Programming that was critical not only of the Democrats and liberals, but even of, of certain Republicans. There was a lot of criticism of Dwight Eisenhower being soft against communism by these programs and by groups like the John Birch Society back at that time. Well, there was a, a little-known rule in the FCC called the Fairness Doctrine that supposedly meant that, that said that you had to have uh, opposing views on, on the air. It had never really been used before, but the Kennedy administration at one point figured out that they could use this as a battering ram to go after conservative broadcasters. I'm going to uh, give you some information here from a terrific book called The Right Frequency by Fred V. Lucas that discusses a lot of this in detail and actually discusses the, the entire history of uh, conservative talk radio. It's a very interesting book. If you have a chance, go out there and, and grab a hold of it. Um, this seemed to really rear its ugly head and become a, a big strategy for Kennedy and the Democrats. Uh, when Kennedy was pushing to get a nuclear test ban treaty with the Soviet Union approved by the United States Senate, uh, it was a treaty that at the time had bipartisan support and, and, and opposition on both sides, and it was expected to be a close vote. And uh, there was a concern about the criticism the treaty was getting on the radio from some of these conservative broadcasters. I'm going to quote directly from Lucas's book here as he takes over, and he says, quote, Kenneth O'Donnell, the appointment secretary for President Kennedy, sought the advice of former New York Times reporter Wayne Phillips on forcing stations to provide equal time. A behind-the-scenes effort prompted the front group Citizens Committee for Nuclear, a Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which targeted talk radio. The Rudder and Finn Public Relations Firm, which coincidentally is the same PR firm the, D, the Democratic National Committee used, did publicity for the committee. Each time uh, Reverend McIntyre or Rev Reverend Hargis took a swing at the treaty, the committee sent letters to the stations that carried their programs. States where the sh these show air shows aired... Uh, that had senators on the fence were specifically targeted. A special program is taped specifically for the responding in each of these stations. When the Senate ratified the treaty by a surprising 80-19 vote on September 24, 1963, the administration saw how the Fairness Doctrine can be used for high-priority legislation. So they took the uh, Fairness Doctrine and used it as a battering ram. Well, that lesson was not lost on the next president, Lyndon Baines Johnson. And Johnson, in the run-up to his 1964 election bid, took note and used a similar strategy. Again, quoting from the Lucas book, Bill Rudder, an assistant secretary of commerce in the Johnson administration, recalled, our massive strategy was to use the fairness doctrine to challenge and harass right-wing broadcasters and hope that the challenge would be so costly to them that they would be inhibited and decide it was too expensive to continue. And then going on here to the result of that election, Lucas writes, the end result was that stations gave Democrats 1,678 free hours of response time resulting from 1,035 letters of complaints, mostly to programs of Clarence Mannion, Dan Smoot, and Carl McIntyre. A proud Phillips wrote, even more important than the free radio time was the effectiveness of this operation in inhibiting the political activity of these right-wing broadcasts. 
Martin E. Firestone, a former FCC attorney who was brought into the Democratic National Committee fold as a consultant in the operation, said it should not end with the campaign. Quote, the, the right-wingers operate on a strictly cash basis, and it is for this reason that they are carried by so many small stations. Were our efforts to be continued on a year-round basis, we would find that many of these stations would consider these programs bothersome and burdensome, especially if they are ultimately required to give us free time, and would start dropping the programs from their broadcast schedules. End quote. Well, that's exactly what ended up happening. After the Johnson administration... A lot of these Republican, and not Republican, but very conservative broadcasters fell by the wayside because stations did not want to put up with the, the bother of trying to find an opposing Democratic program or liberal program to put on the air or giving out free time. They just stopped broadcasting them. And the result of that for about 30 years was that true conservative rhetoric, true conservative thought, true conservative ideas were devoid from radio and television. It was, as you've just seen, a concerted strategy by the American left to deny opposing views an opportunity to give their peace in the public sphere. And now I believe this push to remove these so-called fake news sites from our internet searches and from our social media I view it as pretty much the same thing, folks. Make no mistake. I know that there are false news sites, fake news sites out there, and I know people will post anything on the Internet, and I know that you can't automatically automatically trust anything you see on the Internet. But you know what? I also know you can't trust anything you see out of the mainstream media either. And I think it's pretty insulting for people like the Democrats and even our own outgoing president to assume that you and I, the American people, are so darn stupid that we need them to sift through all the news and tell us what is real and what isn't. Whenever I see a big news story happening, especially one that's unfolding right before our eyes, be it like a, a big shooting or a terrorist attack or any of the big you know, stories that we see, I've noticed that the last thing I do is sit around and wait for the mainstream media to tell me what's going on. I go into social media. I go into Twitter. I want to see all of the information that's out there. And I know that not all of that information is true. I know I'm sifting through raw information, and I've got to make sense of it. But you know what? I'm comfortable with that. I'm a lot more comfortable with that than I am letting some social media site or some journalist or, worse yet, some government official sift through it all for me and tell me what's important. To say nothing of who's making the decision and the determination of what is fake and what isn't. This election showed a lot of things to Washington and to the media. But I think one of the major things it showed was that the mask is off of them and the American people are on to their game. We know their bias, we know their ideology, we know their motivations. And we are no longer the suckers that our grandparents and great-grandparents were who would sit down every night and listen to Edward R. Murrow trash Joe McCarthy and automatically believe it. Or who would sit down every night and listen to Walter Cronkite trash what we were doing in the Vietnam War or trash Richard Nixon and automatically believe it. We're not suckers like that. We can think for ourselves. And yes, we as consumers of media, consumers of journalism, consumers of news, we each on our own will have to take on the burden of sifting through information and making the determination of what is real and what is not, what makes sense, what doesn't, what is right and what is wrong. But I should say that it is far more beneficial to the American people to do that individually than to defer that task to a group of people who have been doing that for a number of decades and in doing so have advanced policies that have literally destroyed this country. We no longer need you in the media or you in the government to tell us what's right and wrong. We can figure it out ourselves and dare I say this election was proof of it. 
keep your hands off of our search engines and our news sites and so forth. Let us read what we want, and we'll make the determination of what is real and what isn't. Folks, we thank you once again for joining us on America's Evil Genius. This is Travis Cook. We'll see you next week.